Um, I'll let you get started, and thanks for being here today. Great. Thank you so much, Jim, for having me. Um, yes, uh, Joseph Sully Pone, um, political scientist and economist at the Libertarian Institute, also a professor of history at Spring Arbor University, um, just down the road here. Uh, the book, uh, The Big China Threat and Its Very Real Danger, um, out of the Libertarian Institute this last year. Uh, the book itself, uh, and in the several talks that I've already given about the topic, go into the dynamics of, of what drives China, uh, what drives U.S. foreign policy making toward China, and some of the reasons that I and others believe that China is no threat to take over the world despite what the, the corporate media might have you believe. Um, and so today what I have actually is an excerpt from the uh, expanded paperback edition, which just came out uh, last month. And this one has to do with uh, the fake China threat and the future of freedom in America. Hence the title, The Fake China Threat and the Future of American Freedom, or War as the Health of the State. So I want to begin this uh, brief address on the relationship between restrictions on individual liberty by the state on the one hand, and war or intense security competition between states on the other. With a few passages from someone you'll likely be familiar with, Indeed, he's often heralded, appropriately so, in my opinion, as the father of, moder of modern conservative uh, opinion in the United States, intellectual leader of the Republican Party in the latter half of the 20th century. The following excerpts come from a 1952 article for Commonweal Magazine entitled A Young Republican, the Party in the Deep Blue Sea, in which William F. Buckley, founder of the National Review, expressed the following sentiments. Deeming Soviet power to be a menace to American freedom, we shall have to rearrange sensibly our battle plans. And this means that we have got to accept big government for the duration of the Cold War contest. For neither an offensive nor a defensive war can be waged except through the instrument of a totalitarian bureaucracy within our shores. And that conservatives and Republicans specifically must support large armies and air forces, atomic energy, central intelligence, war production boards, and the attendant centralization of power in Washington. Or, he argued, it was better to lose our freedoms to a, quote, ignoramus from Missouri than a, quote, bandit from Georgia. Those references being to then President Harry Truman and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, respectively. That is, it's better to surrender the classically liberal American heritage of limited government and individual freedom to domestic rather than foreign tyrants, and to embrace, uh, instead of freedom, individualism, and constitutionalism, central banking, domestic spying, a bloated bureaucracy, welfare programs, and a permanent arms industry. To be sure, Buckley made sure to bemoan this alleged necessity, citing in his article all the appropriate luminaries of what the Austrian school economist Murray Rothbard would later call the old right, from Albert Nock to H.L. Mencken. Ideally, Buckley wrote, the Republican Party platform should acknowledge a domestic enemy, that is, the state. But in his words, such, quote, idealism must be set aside in the name of national security. The formula, which I'm sure all of you hear by now, in the wake of the 9-11 years are now tragically familiar, at least I hope you are. They hate us for our freedom, and it's that which we must sacrifice in order to safeguard our freedom. Far from being just another laughable Bushism, this sad remark is the history of the United States since the dawn of the 20th century, the century of almost permanent war, hot or cold. In the words of the great libertarian intellectual Robert Higgs, war is the master key of the state. Emergency is its mandate. In fact, Dr. Higgs has written uh, several very excellent histories in which he charts the growth of government power in the United States, showing how it almost always, as a rule, coincided with periods of war, whether declared or otherwise. In other words, to quote Randolph Bourne, the left-wing anti-war activist of the early 20th century, war is the health of the state. This relationship between war, the preparation for war, and the loss of individual freedom to government is so obvious, one can find any number of such quotations to this effect even if this common sense wisdom does in the day-to-day -day bustle of life and the thousands of decisions that entails too often get lost, shuffled into the background. Provisions violating our most fundamental rights stuffed into the footnotes of bills thousands of pages long and passed without ever having been read, such as the 2012 Defense Authorization Act, which contained a to this point unused but still active provision allowing for the arrest and indeterminate detention of US persons by the US military, the suspension of habeas corpus. Oftentimes, other times, as in the case of the Patriot Act, many of the most egregious aspects of which are still alive and well today, these were passed to tumultuous applause by masses, either so deluded as to believe sacrificing their freedom makes them free, or else too scared to even think at all. I could spend an hour just talking about the abuses of the National Security Agency following the passage of the 2007 quote-unquote Protect America Act, the PRISM program, the FISA courts, etc. 
Large scale cooperative interaction requires trust. Lies of the kind Washington has employed in pursuit of its foreign policy objectives, from reordering the Middle East to better secure Israel's interests, which didn't work, to provoking a war with Russia over Ukraine, which also didn't work, to pervasively spying on and lying to Americans. Obviously, all of these policies destroy that trust. But as these policies so near and dear to the state can only be maintained by lies, truth becomes, in the words of Ron Paul, a kind of treason. Hence, in our new age of democratized media, where a call to someone upstairs at the New York Times from the White House can no longer keep a story off the front pages or effectively spin it into a kind of confused irrelevance, we see the rise of so-called, quote, malinformation. That is information the government accepts as true, but declares inconvenient and in need of suppressing. Using the screen of big tech to do this dirty work, its cozy relationship with the government so open Georgetown professors, sitting on the Council of Foreign Relations, can now write openly and unabashedly about it. We are increasingly headed for a digital panopticon that makes the efforts of the East German Stasi look absolutely laughable by comparison. The newest justification for these policies is, of course, the fake China threat. The preposterous notion that China is on the cusp of taking over America or the world, that they've stolen all the jobs and technology, which Washington's policies actually sent over there, that they created an opioid crisis in rural America, once again, part of Washington's own failed policies blowing up in our faces, and most ridiculously of all, are making Washington look bad by publicly, dis publicly disagreeing with Washington's Middle East policies and undermining its policies elsewhere by disagreeing over Ukraine, for example. In opening, I chose to pick on the Republicans because it is they who in the 20th century and on into the 21st have seemingly always been the first and loudest to decry the, quote, growth of big government or infringements on our liberties, etc. However, as I will show the project, especially since the Second World War, has been a thoroughly bipartisan one. In some ways, this goes all the way back to the founding decades of the Republic. In 1798, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed, which effectively criminalized criticism of the government by suppressing pro-French sentiments during a conflict between the United States and France, the so-called Quasi-War. The Civil War, of course, brought even more egregious violations of, of liberal values. In 1861, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus, that is, he granted the military the authority to arrest and detain individuals indefinitely without trial. And then, even more terrible, in 1863, the Radical Republican Congress passes and Lincoln signs the so-called Enrollment Act. You have to love the government and all these nice euphemisms. Who could object to enrolling people after all? What is that, anyway? It was the establishment of forced labor or conscription, of forcing men under penalty of the loss of their freedoms to go and fight and kill in the name of Washington's declared policy aims. The defense of these and the actions to come are always the same, but they are necessary to safeguard your freedom and not Washington's power, which is untrue. Woodrow Wilson, one of the worst presidents we've ever had, went farther. Apart from establishing the Federal Reserve, which has eroded the purchasing power of the dollar to virtually nothing since its inception 100 years ago, and making permanent the income tax, he denied that there were even such things as, quote, unwilling draftees. The draftees being Americans, and Americans being represented by Congress, and Congress having passed this new desired conscription act, no one could be said to have been taken unwillingly into the government's service. Wilson went still further, creating a public committee on information, also known as the Creel Commission, in order to generate the necessary public support to take the country into World War I, a totally pointless conflict that wrecked Europe and had nothing to do with America at all. George Creel, the man Wilson personally chose to head this overt propaganda office, that word hadn't yet acquired its negative connotations, simply meant advertising. Creel and his team utilized various forms of media, including newspapers, posters, films, and pamphlets to promote patriotic sentiment, but they also engaged in extensive censorship, stifling dissent and criticism of the government's war policies. It promoted a, a fervent atmosphere of patriotism and conformity, leading to the suppression of anti-war sentiments and the curtailment of free speech. The Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918 further contributed to this erosion of civil liberties as individuals face persecution for suppressing opinions perceived as disloyal or undermining the war effort. Famously or infamously, a minister in Vermont was imprisoned for distributing a pamphlet which seven people read, in which he said the war should not be supported by a Christian. Eugene Debs would die in prison, having been locked up for telling people to oppose the draft. Once again, it had been made a crime to disagree with the government. And while the Sedition Act was allowed to lapse once the war had ended, the Espionage Act would survive, and indeed many of its provisions remain to this day. Though as we know, from many brave leakers over the past 20 years, agencies like the NSA have gone far beyond anything that could have been imagined in the 1910s. World War II featured similar efforts at manipulating public opinion. The Office of War Information, or OWI, 
was established in 1942 to coordinate wartime propaganda efforts. The OWI produced a variety of materials, including posters, films, and radio broadcasts to maintain public support for the war, to encourage enlistment and promote war bond sales. While the U.S. propaganda efforts were generally less coercive than World War I, they still ended up fostering a strong sense of national unity and patriotism. Of course, the propaganda effort in this case didn't need to be quite so strong as the Japanese had clearly and viciously attacked the United States, and then Hitler had pretty inexplicably to this day decided to declare war on the United States, giving Roosevelt the entry into the European war he had actually wanted. However, in terms of taking a wider view of the manipulation of events and of public opinion, I'll let Harry Stimson, FDR's Secretary of War, have the last word, writing in his diary, which was later submitted as part of a congressional testimony, and you can read it today online. The insanely tedious records are all there, all 10,000 pages, which read in part, quote, spent the evening talking with the president, the great difficulty being how to maneuver the Japanese into being seen as having fired the first shot without allowing too much danger to ourselves. Cries of unprovoked to follow. The more things change. But wait a second, you might be saying, these were all Democrat policies. Okay, there was Teddy Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge, powerful early 20th century Republicans who were avidly imperialist. But how did we get from the so-called isolationist Republicans of World War II, who opposed entry even into that great and noble conflict against Hitler, to George W. Bush, who wanted to declare war on everyone? That is quite the jump, and Richard Nixon is a good halfway point. Something in itself instructive, because Nixon was a creature of the forces that took over the Republican Party in the late 1940s and early 1950s. This, of course, gets us back to where I began this talk, belittling Bill Buckley for his part in destroying what opposition there was to putting the United States on a permanent war footing, creating a permanent arms industry, a sprawling alliance network of dependencies, and endless government programs and bureaucracies, and all justified based on the exaggerated threats supposedly posed to America by the Soviet Union. The concentrated benefits and diffuse costs of these programs meant that even after it was so evident that the Soviets couldn't possibly pose any threat to the United States, that it was frankly admitted, the policies continued. Through disastrous wars in Asia of unimaginable brutality in Korea and Vietnam, support of the bloodiest dictatorships you can imagine, like in Indonesia, and the fostering of Islamic fundamentalism as a counterweight to secular Arab nationalism, and later as a weapon against the Soviet Union in Central Asia. Through domestic government spying initiatives such as COINTELPRO, a series of covert and often illegal projects conducted by the FBI from 1956 to 1971, whose main object was to surveil, infiltrate, discredit, and disrupt domestic political organizations deemed as subversive or radical. Through the end of the mad logic of the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s, these policies continue. And once their alleged uh, raison d'etre, the existence of the Soviet Union vanished in the early 1990s, yet more reasons were found to continue the same policies. It's hundreds of billions of dollars a year we're talking about here, after all, and the kind of power and purview the framers of the United States Constitution were right to fear and distrust. Power corrupts. In the words of the late uh, libertarian historian uh, Ralph Rako, the 20th century was the century of the state, the century of that Nietzschean will to power, to dominate, to impose control on others. Russell Kirk, author of The Conservative Mind and a True Luminary of Classical Liberalism, in a series of Heritage Foundation lectures on the errors being made at the end of the 20th century, had these critical and insightful words to say as George Bush Sr. was plowing ahead with the first Iraq War, a conflict essentially fought in support of British interests in Kuwaiti debt and oil leases, as well as Saudi security concerns, but also probably the result of a miscommunication between Washington and one of its Middle East proxies against the Iranians, Saddam Hussein. A war which ultimately resulted in the permanent stationing of troops in Saudi Arabia, which along with support for Israel's policies for the Palestinians formed the core of bin Laden's grievances against the United States, which he expressed in an open letter to America, and which ultimately culminated in the attacks on 9-11, thus kicking off the war on terror, six trillion dollars of wasted money, the Patriot Act, black site torture facilities, etc. But anyway, back to Russell Kirk and his wisdom. He wrote, moved by sorrow rather than wrath. He lamented that despite the death of the former imperial powers of Europe, there, quote, remains an American empire still growing through the acquisition of, of client states whose heavy belligerent domination would foster a widespread impulse to pull down the imperial power. And that eventually, like the Soviets, Napoleon or King George, the task of repression would be too much to bear, and the perpetual war for peace would produce conditions not dissimilar to those of George Orwell's 1984, with dissent criminalized, the American people impoverished, and the state almighty above all. And this gets to the heart of the matter. For what is at stake vis-a-vis -vis China is not America's freedom, its existence, the lives, livelihoods, or prosperity of its people. What is at stake, the real thing China threatens is, in the words of then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, quoted by Bob Woodward, 
in the US is the US Navy's, quote, complete domination of the Pacific, right up to the shores of China itself. Beyond the empty rhetoric of democracy promotion, the US has and still does partner with the most vicious of tyrants, so long as they acquiesce to Washington's security prerogatives. Just look at Egypt. This is what you're being asked to fight and die for, to send your sons and daughters to fight over, to risk the destruction of all life on Earth over, so a bunch of admirals can get new ships, so think tank flunkies funded by foreign governments don't have to get real jobs, and defense contractors and shareholders continue to be well paid. In the words of Scott Horton, it is understandable, but unacceptable. And if it continues, the fault will be our own for continuing to elect Democrats and Republicans who, whatever else they disagree on, agree that nodding along and taking money from defense contractors and foreign government lobbyists is a lot easier than doing the actual work of policymaking on behalf of the American people. To return to where I began this talk by picking on Bill Buckley, he opts in the above essay to bring the American founder Thomas Jefferson into the discussion, quoting him. He would have done better to remember his Franklin. Those who would trade their freedom for security will wind up with neither. But then that would have defeated the entire purpose of his apology for the state, its expanding power, and U.S. militarism abroad, which has bankrupted us morally as well as economically, making us less safe, less free, and has brought us to the edge of destruction. We would do well, ironically, to recall the words of Abraham Lincoln, to be confident in ourselves, the strength of our positions, and the righteousness of the path laid out for us long ago, to follow in the name of realizing liberty in one land, these United States. Lincoln said this, Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasure of the earth in their military chests, with a bone apart for their commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point, then, is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we will live forever or die by suicide. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Yes? So you've got an entire political system established, uh, whether you call them Republican or Democrat, who basically work on the same side of that coin. So what do you do about it? Well, despite the very reasonable inclination towards cynicism and apathy with regard to uh, the Democrats and Republicans, I will say this. Their number one priority is being reelected, And especially at the level of a congressional representative, they check their inboxes and check with their staffers all the time. And so if they get a lot of calls saying don't do this, even if someone offers to contribute to their campaign, they will not do that. Because they understand that a few tens of thousands of votes, a little bit of bad opinion in their own community is enough to lose them their job. And their job is their number one priority. The problem is they don't receive a lot of pushback because Americans don't need to be that concerned about what goes on overseas. We are energy independent. We are food independent. Things that happen abroad are just not that important, except to a very small, concentrated group of people who benefit from these policies. And again, the cost to Americans, uh, we did the math at the Institute one time, comes to like something like 80 bucks a year or something like that. But it's all of us, so like 80 bucks. Oh uh, gosh, you know, 80 bucks, that's not that much. Spread out over the course of a year, what is that, like 30 cents a day or something like that? What is this $80 for? To, to basically fund the whole military establishment, to have the 800 foreign military bases, to be able to give all this aid to all these different countries. Even if you the ever, money that has been sent to Ukraine lately? Yes, yes. Uh, and one thing that, that, that I find interesting is that defenders of this policy have recently taken to saying, no, 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 don't worry. This money isn't actually going to Ukraine. It's going to all our military contractors here in the United States. So don't worry. It's helping fund jobs in America. And the idea that America's economy can't survive without jobs predicated on killing people is, is just crazy. I mean, that's such a small fraction of our industrial manufacturing anyway. And even if all the jobs in America required making weapons so that other people could kill each other, I, I think it would still be an immoral position to take. Thankfully, it's not true. It's just propaganda. But, yes. 
Well, apathy is one thing until they're bringing, our government is bringing people via airplanes into the inner parts of America. I mean, there, you can actually see the flights come in from all over the place and you put people in Kansas and in Detroit. I, I don't think that it's going to be apathy for very long when they actually have a larger intake of individuals coming into the country than they have birth rate for American citizens at this point. And so it's not going to be apathy for very long because they're going to be in the backyard. Well, one thing that a colleague of mine, actually, uh, Henry Zamoda, very smart guy, uh, right when the war in Ukraine started, he said, you know what's going to happen here? Because we've seen it a million times now. What's going to happen is Washington is going to pump tons of guns, tons of small arms, tons of money in there. A bunch of it's going to disappear down a black hole. Eventually, Washington will lose interest. The whole thing will fall apart, just like Afghanistan, like a big house of cards. And then you're going to have all of these disillusioned, angry people who feel betrayed and who have tons of small arms access and who are going to be able to get into the United States very easily. Um, the same thing actually happened after the, uh, after the Bay of Pigs um, in Cuba. They brought a lot of those guys here. Um, the same thing happened uh, after Vietnam. And so, you know, the, in the Ukrainian example, uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen there. Obviously, we don't want uh, anything bad to happen. Uh, you know, I and my colleagues uh, are very clear, are very clear that, that we should not be doing any of this. Um, and with regards to, to what's been going on at the, at the southern border, I think it's, it's also very curious. Uh, the next book, uh, which I'm working on, is actually U.S. Foreign Policy and the Origins of the Migrant Crisis. Um, because if you look at the, the countries where these uh, migrants are coming from, there is a very, very strong correlation. And uh, despite the, the old saw that correlation does not equal causation or suggest causation, it very much does suggest causation. And in this case, I think there's very strong reason to believe that that causation is, is true. Um, it's been U.S. Uh, covert involvement in these countries, waging economic warfare on these countries. Uh, for example, Venezuela. Venezuela has been uh, producing lots of migrants over the years. Uh, over the last several years. And if you look at what the United States has been doing, it has been waging uh, an effective uh, political and economic blockade on this country, trying to destroy it and make it poor. Why? Does it matter to Americans whether or not a socialist rules Venezuela? I know very educated people who can't point to Venezuela on a map. And why? Because it's just not that important to the United States. Let them elect whoever they want. And that's another thing that, that undermines America's credibility on the world stage. We're champions of democracy and self-government. Well, unless the wrong guy wins the election, of course, well, then that would be a huge problem, and we're going to need to slap sanctions on them and fund some opposition groups and try and overthrow the government. Victoria Newland, a longtime troublemaker at the State Department, just retired the other day. She's another one. Literally, her entire career, six-figure salary every year, what does she do? Do nothing but cause trouble for us elsewhere. And why? She needs a job, something to do. She's ideologically very motivated to do these things. Um, it is a worldview. It is a worldview. So... Uh, it's not helpful to the American people. Um, I talk to a lot of uh, a lot of Americans uh, outside of the Beltway. That is because inside the Beltway, there is a very different way of thinking about these issues. Uh, the idea that uh, we shouldn't uh, kill people for money or topple some foreign government to put someone we like there, sure, that that's all completely foreign to them. Of course, that's what they do. The average person, you ask the average American, they don't think that's important. They don't think we should do that. Um, and so I, I guess maybe a. Uh, that's, that's part of what, what we're talking about here is, is uh, the fake China threat. You have to drum up enough, in this case, with China, it's a much more comprehensive policy. It's not something that the U.S. government can do by covert means. Uh, if you uh, take a look at what's going on, they're trying to pass tons of legislation to uh, reshore manufacturing, to cut China off from uh, technology imports, for example. These aren't things you can do covertly. You're going to need legislation to get those things passed. And so in order to get legislation passed like this, you are going to need to create a permissive thought climate in order to do that. And there's a whole cottage industry of books, something like 50 books in the last three or four years have been published about what a huge threat China is. And in the book, I have a chapter on it who writes about the big China threat and why. I actually pull up these people's biographies for you and show you this guy is literally getting paid by the defense industry. Like the money is being handed to an intermediary, a think tank, like the American Enterprise Institute, who is then handing it to him. If they were just handing it directly to him, we'd call it bribery. But because we do this like intermediary step, it becomes some sort of legitimate exercise in intellectual pursuit, but it's not. It's not, it's obvious and blatant corruption. And one thing that's now being cracked down on 
a little bit. It's only because it came into the public view and people were a little outraged and so they have to you know, slap someone's hand. But same thing goes with foreign governments. The Saudi government, for example, realized about 10 years ago that they can just pump money into think tanks who will then churn out papers telling the American political class, well, you need to give them more F-35s, you need to do this, you need to do that. You know, all you have to do is you know sign a piece of paper saying you know you're working as a foreign agent. And what happened is a guy forgot to turn in his paperwork, and so it's a whole front page story. And he hadn't. The only thing that he did it wasn't that he was lobbying on their behalf and taking money from them. He said he forgot to fill out this paper. It's all very legalistic. But uh, of course, if you ask the average American, they would say that this is obviously grossly corrupt and not beneficial to us. But concentrated benefits, diffuse costs. Contacting your local reps. Probably the best thing that you can do, um, because frankly, and you know, I'm probably going to catch flack for this, being a libertarian, but third parties, it's just very hard for, for any third party movement to get in there, uh, just because of the way uh, the American electoral system is structured. It's winner take all, it's not proportional representation, uh, it's very hard to keep ballot access, politics is a highly professionalized game. Uh, and the Republicans and Democrats have a huge institutional advantage. They write the rules, they have the infrastructure in place, they have all the local parties, they have huge networks of donors, and they do have a lot of party discipline too. So I think the best thing, if you want to see change in the here and now, in the immediate future, is really uh, when you read about things on the, uh, getting good news sources. In terms of uh, anti-interventionism and stuff, antiwar.com. My colleagues over at antiwar.com, the great Dave DeCamp, you can read him there every day. Um, at the Libertarian Institute, where I work, they do uh, daily news. Uh, Kyle Anselm and Connor Freeman. And when you see something that you don't like, all you have to do, dial up your rep. Most people are very nice, actually, in the offices. I call all the time. And they, you know, they say, hey, what's your name? Uh, where do you live? They just want to check and make sure you're a member of the district. They don't want someone from out of the district calling and complaining. So. Don't be freaked out if they ask you that information. Can I that's, drive yeah, by? That's, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's why they just want to make sure that you're actually in the congressperson's district. Because if you aren't in their district, then the congressperson doesn't care what you say. But if you do live in the district, they definitely care. And if you can get several people in your friend group or your colleagues to call about the same issue, that really puts it on the front burner for them. So it's no guarantee, but I think it is the best way to see some kind of political change at this point. So. Anyone else? First of all, I would like to thank you for you know, giving us uh, this wisdom about the way we have uh, uh, been looking you know, at China, probably. Um, my question is, um, as far as the foreign policy establishment is concerned, uh, particularly towards China, um, I'm wondering if we can have any difference between Republicans and Democrats, um, or put in another word, or, you know, let us put any person in the White House um, and. Uh, do you know make the machine work? Can we have any difference between Republican president and Democrat president? You know, uh, frame policy towards China. That's a good. That's a good question. I think. I think if we if we look at the Ukraine conflict, that was always more of a favorite project of the Democrats. Republicans dragged their feet on that. China, that was initially a Republican project with Democrats dragging their feet on. But what's happened, and especially when it comes to China, is, and you see this with Iran too, you see this with Iran too, if you don't act hyper belligerent and strong, you're just going to get attacked as being weak. And politically, it's frankly more harmful in the polls to be seen as weak. Even if it's completely untrue, even if it's just a smear, it's why President Biden was not able to go get back into the Iran deal. It was his team that put the deal together. It was the Obama team is the Biden team, minus Obama. They put the deal together. It was a perfectly good deal. It was a great deal. Biden should have got back in it. The first thing he got in the way of should have said, Donald Trump, he was a fool. We're getting back in this deal. We're getting back in all these agreements. But he didn't. Why? Because oh, Joe Biden's weak. 
He's going to let Iran boss us around. Like, and of course, this sounds amateurish and childish and kindergartenish. But this is actually the, the stuff that goes on. These are the calculations that get made. Jake Sullivan, his uh, advisor, formerly Hillary Clinton's advisor, he's a political advisor. He views these things strictly through a political prism. In terms of why the policy doesn't seem to change, right? Because even Trump, Trump came into office. What did he say? He said, I want to be friends with Russia. Putin? Like Putin. Good guy. Which, whatever. He's just trying to say things to like be congenial. Whatever. Whatever you think the case may be. It was certainly not Donald Trump's intention to be more belligerent with Russia when he got into office. But what happened? Lethal aid started going to Ukraine. That was something President Obama had been adamant that he would not do. He would not give them uh, lethal aid. The Trump, the Trump years is when the lethal aid started. The U.S. nuclear bomber flights uh, in the Baltic region, those started under Trump. Why did these start under Trump? Was that Trump's policy? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was the Pentagon's policy. And frankly, you can go and look at the um, at the policy paper framework. It's like that's the one thing about living in a democracy is like most of this stuff is publicly available. And I think part of the strategy is because you can't lie all the time and keep these things secret is you just publish so much stuff. You just publish so much stuff that no ordinary person could ever read through all this or even know where to look to read it. And so you get a handful of people who maybe uncover this stuff, but it just doesn't really matter. It's not going to move the needle at all. Um, you know, even the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon Papers didn't end the war in Vietnam, right? That, that thing carried on for years after that, even though it had been shown that uh, they were lying. And that made the front pages of the New York Times. So certainly, uh, you know, a handful of people writing obscure books and things challenging the establishment is not going to make a significant difference. <laughs> not to undermine myself too much there, but um, yes, uh, it's tough because the policies don't seem to change. Whoever we vote for, we seem to get John McCain as president, right? The old, the old crazy war hawk maverick, right? I mean, Barack Obama comes into office, says, ah, oh, Afghanistan, that war was a huge mistake. That war was a huge mistake. Then what happens? Puts more troops into Afghanistan, right? That wasn't Obama's policy, right? Trump, want to be friends with Russia? Were we friends with Russia? No, relations got even worse. Joe Biden, uh, you know, I've got quotes in the book about him in 2019, 2020, 2021 saying, China, we don't need to worry about China. Is that the direction the policy is going? No, no, it's not. Um, so it, it would be nice to think that, you know, just get one guy in there and he can steer the ship in one way or the other, but there is a huge institutional bureaucracy. And this is what I mentioned here, um, and I, I go into it more in, in this book, and there's actually a, a book by a, by a fellow by the name of, a historian named Swanson, um, The War State is what it's called, and he documents the creation of these bureaucracies, the Pentagon, the National Security Establishment, in the Truman and Eisenhower year. These were branches of the government who essentially operated on autopilot because, uh, you know, this, this frankly, it, it does take some pretty technical expertise. You know, you need foreign policy experts, you need weapons experts, you need procurement specialists, things of that nature. You have to plan out ahead of time, you know, in terms of like devoting resources to a project, seeing it through to completion. And of course, Congress and the president have to be very short term in their thinking. Short termism is one of the, one of the things that in the political science literature you find that democracies tend to do kind of a bad job at long-term planning uh, just because the elected people's time horizons is very short. Uh, it's kind of natural. And so you have this, this permanent, you know, uh, I think they call it a, variously you'll see it called a deep state or a shadow government. It's an unelected bureaucracy of people that can't really be fired because they're public government employees and they have this whole institutional framework that is moving in one direction. And, uh, and so that's, that's basically why that happens. Uh, you look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump gets into office and he says, okay, I need some advisors. Who does he want with an advisor? John Bolton? Mike Pompeo? Two of the craziest hawks in the establishment? Where do you get these guys from, right? You know, that's just, that's the pool that you have to draw from. And so the ideas stay the same. So um, I, politically, it's just, it's far too disadvantageous for you to say, Nah, don't worry about China, don't worry about Iran, you know, what's it matter who rules Venezuela, you know, we shouldn't have been messing around in Ukraine, like, how would we feel if some government was sailing ships right off of our shores, you know, military ships and threatening us, you know, that kind of strategic empathy, the ability to see things from the perspective of other people, um, Edward Lutwak, he called it great power autism, he said, great power autism means that you're so powerful as a state, that you can't understand the way that the things you are doing are alienating to other people, or how if someone was doing it to you, you would not be able to tolerate it. 
Um, and so one thing that I would like to say is there is no need for us to feel insecure. Um, the Chinese foreign minister just the other day was giving a talk where he said, you know, for a superpower, the most powerful state on earth, America seems hyper insecure. And it's true. We do seem like we freak out about everything. We act like everything is some huge threat to us. When really, we're the safest, most powerful state that's ever existed or will ever exist in human history. And as Abraham Lincoln observed 150 years ago, no one could ever come to get us, ever. If we're going to be destroyed, it's going to be because of our own bad decisions. And when I look at things like the national debt, when I look at things like the lack of social capital, the political division in the country, the lack of trust, I don't know. 10 years ago, I would have placed long money on it, but uh, these days, not so much, not so much. So we'll have to wait and see. You know what else? All right, thank you all so much. Um, if you're interested in my work, you can find it at the Libertarian Institute. As I said, uh, also, I, uh, I'm a history professor out at Spring Arbor, so if you know anyone who's looking for schooling, higher education, direct them out there, go Cougars. Um, otherwise, uh, like I said, check the Libertarian Institute, The Fake China Threat and Its Very Real Danger, um, right here. Copies, Jim has them, and of course, at the Libertarian Institute, and available where all fine books are sold. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you.